Hello everyone, I'm Luke Jolinella and welcome to my virtual learning lab. I hope everyone is doing well under quarantine and keeping themselves from being bored. While 2020 has not seemed like a very fun year at all, there are still some things to look forward to. For instance, this November, the 2020 presidential election will take place. And I will be talking about presidential elections today. I will discuss the various processes of the presidential election cycle, and then we'll do a fun activity about the electoral college at the end. Firstly, let me tell you a little bit about myself. As I said, my name is Luke Jolinella, and one of the reasons I'm talking about presidential elections today is because of my organization, GovLearn. GovLearn seeks to provide an online, easily accessible curriculum of government and politics to elementary, middle, and high school students across the country. I created GovLearn because I think government and politics are incredibly important to teach to young students because when they grow up and they are of voting age, they should know about how government works and they should know what they're voting for at the ballot. Um, I also really enjoy learning about politics, history, and humanities. I also love participating in debate and Maori United Nations. Now that you know me, let's get started in talking about the presidential election cycle. Firstly, the materials you're gonna need for our activity at the end are a pencil or pen, as well as blue and red crayons, markers, colored pencils or pens, or any sort of writing implement that are blue and red. You will also need a printer to print a copy of this image here of the United States. You will need to take a screenshot and you can print it out um, like that, and then you're gonna shade those in later, but we'll get to that at the end. Firstly, let's talk about how a president is elected um, and the timeline of that. First, um, candidates would announce that they're running for president. Um, these announcements are typically conducted via rallies or online videos. In 2016, Hillary Clinton announced her candidacy via online video, but Republican candidate Donald Trump announced his candidacy via rally. Rallies are often high energy events used to raise morale and support for a campaign. You'd see large crowds at stadiums and you'd have the candidate speak about the issues and announce their candidacy, bring guest speakers and people who support their campaign on stage with them, um, as well as, you know, engage the audience and raise support for their campaign. You can see also in the images, Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden in 2020 announced his candidacy via online video. Um, and you also see the image in 2016 of Donald Trump announcing his candidacy via campaign rally. Um, next, we get to the primaries, campaigning for the nomination. During the primaries, the candidates vie for their political party's nomination for president. Um, a political party is defined as an organized group of people with at least roughly similar aims and opinions that seek to influence public policy by getting its candidates elected to public office. The two major political parties in the United States are the Democratic Party, which sits on the left wing of the political spectrum or progressive, and the Republican Party, which sits on the right wing of the political spectrum or conservative. Um, candidates in each of those parties win states in their own party primaries. Whoever wins the most votes wins the majority of delegates in the state, but we'll get to that in a second, and caucuses. But caucuses are slightly different from primaries in the fact that a caucus, as opposed to a primary where you go to a polling place and vote, cast your ballot, a caucus is a meeting at which local members of a certain political party register their preference among candidates running for office by rank choice, one, two, three, four, five, who do you support the most, who do you support the least? And they select delegates to attend a convention. The candidate who wins the most precincts in a caucus wins the state, not the most votes necessarily. This is because caucuses and their winners are measured by the expanse of a candidate's victory, not vote count in particular, as opposed to primaries in which voters cast their votes at the polls and the person with the most votes obtains the majority of delegates. However, delegates are allocated allocated proportionally. For instance, you will need, a candidate will need to obtain 15% um, of the popular vote in a state to obtain a certain number of delegates from that state. For instance, if a candidate got 14% of the vote in New Hampshire's primaries, then they would not receive any delegates from New Hampshire. However, if a candidate received 16%, then they would receive some delegates from New Hampshire. The person with the most percentage wins the most votes. If one candidate gets above 15% and everyone else is below 15%, then they will take um, all of the pledged delegates from that state. Um, here are some photos from the 2020 primaries. You can see um, the remaining Democratic candidates, Bernie Sanders and Joe Biden at a presidential debate, which was held with no live audience due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
you can see Senator Sanders with Congress, sorry, with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez at one of his rallies and former candidate Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. After the primaries comes the convention. Um, all candidates from a political party and all delegates from that political party meet in a designated city for their convention. For instance, a candidate for the Democratic nomination was, must win a majority of combined delegate votes. In 2020, this number is 1,991 at the Democratic National Convention to become the Democratic presidential nominee and face the Republican nominee in the general election. Pledged delegates are chosen by state and local parties and are assigned to vote for a particular candidate and cannot change their vote unless the candidate that they are supposed to vote for drops out and endorses another candidate in which case they would vote for that other candidate to receive the candidate's endorsement. The nominee would then proceed to the general election where they will face in um, someone from the other political party. However, what if a candidate does not reach that number, in which case there are super delegates, aka unpledged delegates. These are delegates at the convention who, this is only for the Democratic Party, the Republican Party does not have as many super delegates. However, in the Democratic Party, the person who wins um, the superdelegates are determined by popular vote, which means that if you were a superdelegate, you would not be assigned to vote for a particular candidate. You would vote for whoever you thought should be the nominee. And then at the end, whoever wins the majority of those would become the nominee. This is an image from the 2016 Democratic National Convention. Um, Oftentimes the conventions are called mega rallies because of the amounts of crowds that they bring in and the amount of support that they raise for a certain political party. Um, either before or at the party convention, the president chooses a running mate, AKA the person who they would pick to be their vice president or their vice presidential candidate. Um, a running mate in terms of a presidential election is someone who, if that candidate is elected, would serve as vice president or second in command under their government. There have been some few occasions when the vice presidential candidates are announced before it is clear that a candidate has won or lost the party's nomination, such as in 2016 when Texas Senator Ted Cruz chose former 2016 candidate Carly Fiorina as his running mate, but later went on to lose, <clears throat> sorry, lose the Republican Party nomination to Donald Trump in 2016. Um, on the left, you see in 2008, Barack Obama picked by, um, Senator Joe Biden to be his vice presidential nominee. On the top right, you see Ted Cruz and Carly Fiorina. And on the bottom right, you can see current president and vice president, Donald Trump and Mike Pence. Following the convention, we move into the general election, of course, which would be Democrats versus Republicans, um, mostly. The general election is the period in which nominees from both political parties campaign to win the presidency. The modern general election consists of many rallies and debates. Debates are televised events in which the candidates are asked questions by a moderator, who's often a journalist or news anchor from a mainstream news service, CNN, NBC, Fox, about their stances on political issues. There are two main types of general election debates, town hall debates and podium debates. Podium debates are debates in which candidates stand behind podiums and lecterns and answer questions directly from the moderator. The moderator can choose to take audience questions, but most of the time this is not the case. Town halls, however, are debates that are more informal in which candidates walk around the stage and answer questions from audience members about the issues. Finally, we get to the Electoral College. What is it and how does it work? The Electoral College is a process, not a place, that the Founding Fathers established in the Constitution as a compromise between the election of the president by congressional vote, which would mean the House of Representatives would vote to elect a president, and the popular vote, which means the people would vote to elect the president. The Electoral College consists of 538 electors and 270 electoral votes are required to win the presidency. The amount of electoral votes per state are determined by the number of senators, which is always two per state, plus the number of representatives, which is determined by the population. For instance, California has 53 members of the House of Representatives and two senators, which means that it would have 55 electoral votes. New York has 29, Florida has 29. These are states with large populations. However, a state like um, North Dakota would have three electoral votes. It doesn't have that many because it has a smaller population. 
in the Electoral College, the District of Columbia or Washington, D.C., is treated as a state in that it has three electoral votes, even though it does not have Senate representation. The Electoral College goes off of a winner-take-all system. 49 of 51 groups of electors, I'm using groups of electors because we're including Washington, D.C., use a winner-takes-all or plurality system, which means that if a candidate had the highest percentage of popular vote in the state, they would be entitled to all of the electoral votes in that state. For instance, in a swing state, or which I'll get to later, a very close state such as Florida, if a candidate obtains 49% and the other candidate obtains 48%, the candidate with more percentage would win all 29 electoral votes out of Florida. However, the other two states that are not part of those 49 are Maine and Nebraska. Each allocate one vote for the statewide vote. The statewide vote is everywhere else and one vote for each congressional district that they have. Now let's get to swing states. What are they and why are they so important? A US state where the two major political parties have similar levels of support among voters is viewed as important in determining the overall result of a presidential election. And they're often known as swing, which means they can swing from party to party or battleground states where both candidates from both parties campaign heavily to try to win their support. Candidates campaign higher in these states to earn their electoral votes and often visit these states much more than safe states. Safe states are states that have consistently voted for a certain political party over time. However, this doesn't guarantee victory in an election. Hillary Clinton, the Democratic candidate for president in 2016, did not often visit considered Democratic safe states, Michigan and Wisconsin, as her opponent Donald Trump did. And she ended up losing those states in the election and ended up losing the presidency. There aren't just the Democratic and Republican parties, even though they are the two major political parties. So what are third parties or independent parties? Um, parties like the Green Party, which stands for environmentalism, and the Libertarian Party, which stands for um, free rights, tend to garner up to 1% to 5% of the popular vote in many states. However, no third party candidate has won a state, excuse me, in the Electoral College since George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, who was a part of the American Independent Party. In 1968, he won the states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia, though he did not win a presidential election. The last time an independent won a presidential election was George Washington in 1789 and 1792. The Electoral College puts third parties at a disadvantage as they rarely gain a plurality or majority of the popular vote in a state, which means they can never win popular electoral votes. Election resources that you can use during the coming election cycle are 270towin.com. You can use that to test the electoral college, look at um, polls and see, um, you can change states from Democratic to Republican and see who do you think will win the presidential election in 270 to win um, in 2020. We're gonna be doing an activity very similar to that in a moment. Realclearpolitics.com gives um, many, many polls of the presidential election, both primaries and the general election, so you could get an interesting view of how the election is shaped. C-SPAN, c-span.org, um, gives unbiased raw news coverage of politicians giving speeches, campaign rallies on the congressional floors, where you could just see and judge um, what candidates are doing on your own without any commentary by news anchors. PewResearch.org is also a reliable polling source. You can go there to look somewhat like real clear politics, but Pew Research, Research does more deep research, whereas real clear politics um, takes various research from, re, research from many resources and merges them together to create um, one poll. You can also go to the three remaining major presidential candidates' websites to learn more about them in particular. JoeBiden.com, BernieSanders.com, those two are both campaigning for the Democratic presidential nomination, or DonaldJTrump.com, who is the Republican nominee. Key dates in election 2020. While the Democratic National Convention was supposed to take place in July, it was postponed to August 17th through the 20th because of the COVID-19 pandemic. That will take place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, though it will be televised across the nation. About a week later on the 24th through the 27th, the Republicans will hold their convention in Charlotte, North Carolina, where they will um, 
presumptively nominate, renominate President Donald J. Trump as their nominee since he has garnered a majority of um, delegates in the Republican primary so far. On September 29th, the first presidential debate will be held between Donald Trump and the Democratic nominee. Um, on October 7th, the vice presidential debate will be held between Vice President Mike Pence and the Democratic vice presidential nominee. Two more debates will take place between the presidential candidates on October 15th and October 22nd. And then you can go to cspan.org. You can look at all those resources and view campaign rallies as they go into the home stretch of the campaign leading up to November 3rd or election day. Um, I will say that there are often things called October surprises, which means something bad shows up about a campaign in October and kind of throws their campaign overboard in a way. Um, they have happened all, a lot of the time to many campaigns and I've often doomed them. Um, it is a funny thing to watch. I mean, I wouldn't use the word funny, but it's fun to watch and see how um, the feel of the political climate evolves over time, especially with such little time to go before election day. So keep watching, keep watching the primaries. There may be more debates between, in the Democratic primary between Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders. Um, watch their rallies, watch the news, learn what's going on, and be in the know as, you can, as we continue to move to election day. Now let's move to our activity. Um, as I said, the materials required. If you haven't done that, you can pause this right now, gather the resources you need, pencil or pen, blue and red crayons, markers, colored pencils or pens, and a printed copy of this image. Take a screenshot, print it out, have it big so you can shade some states in. So I'll let you pause for a second. All right. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide, so feel free to pause this slide if you need to get the information. The instructions for this Electoral College activity are this. You have to write down in the state borders the electoral votes of each state using a pencil or pen. An image of the electoral vote count will be on the next slide, so you can pause that slide too. For the District of Columbia, which doesn't appear on that map, you could just draw a little square with a pen on the um, white ridges of the map right in DC and then write in three, which is the amount of electoral votes they have. Then you will use your blue and red writing implements to shade in each state based on which party you think will win those states in 2020. You do not need to divide Maine and Nebraska's electoral votes as they do. It will just get very complicated with congressional districts. I don't want, you put you through, I don't want to put you through that torture, so just um, keep the Maine and Nebraska as one state um, and use DC as well. Blue for the Democratic Party, red for the Republican Party. Then you will calculate the electoral vote totals for each party, um, and then you can declare a winner. You can take a picture of your results, um, email your predictions to me at my email, lukemac914 at gmail.com, and or you could email it to the IEA at iaagifted at educationaladvancement.org for them to see. I would love to see what you think about the election. It's gonna be very interesting to watch as we go forward. Here is the Electoral College map that I was discussing. You can pause here, look around, take notes of the electoral map, take notes of the electoral votes. And my apologies that these aren't showing. Um, some of the states are not showing. Let me just fix this really quickly. My sorry, technical difficulties. Um, but there, you can pause on this and you can take a look. New Hampshire, Vermont, all those small states, you can see pointed out what their electoral vote totals are. All right, so thank you so much for coming to my virtual learning lab. This has been very fun. I love talking about presidential elections. I hope you do too. Stay focused, stay in the know. Um, I would love to see what you have to do with this activity. I would love to see what results you come up with. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming. Have a great day, enjoy quarantine. I'm sorry, I'm having technical difficulties here. All right, thank you, bye.